Thanks, Caitlin. Um, again, my name is Kelsey Myrie, um, and I am very excited to introduce Dr. Kyle Bobbywash. He is an Indigenous scholar and a professor of entomology at um, the University of Manitoba um, in Winnipeg, in Canada. And um, he has been very generous in joining us today. Um, his talk that he's going to be giving today um, is titled Pollination, Ecology as Scientific Reparations. And I will let Kyle uh, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. And uh, no, I, I thank you for the invite, everybody. It's really uh, no, a pleasure to, to meet all of you. I wish we, I could uh, travel down and just kind of hang out with everybody, but uh, that'll have to wait till another time. Uh, so, Ani Bojo, Nagoman Mung Dijnikas, Mung Dodem, Mr. Eshagen in Dojba. Yeah, so I'm Kyle Bobbywash. Um, and I'm sh sharing my screen, I hope. I hope everybody can see it. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, you know, Caitlin said, oh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to talk a little bit about bees, a lot more about other things. Um, but then I'm going to kind of show you some, uh, a cool website that uh, you can, you folks yourselves can start populating uh, and, and going through. Uh, but I'm going to give you a lot of kind of the things that make me very excited about bees. Um, so something I like to always consider and think about is, you know, how the heck did I get into bees or into entomology, right? It's such a disparate field. You know, I applied to med school. I was I had big dreams of making a lot of money and you know being a plastic surgeon to the stars, but somehow I ended up in med school. And something, one of my earliest memories is you know watching. We we had a lot of we had illegal satellite where I'm from, so we had all the American channels. And something that I really loved, we didn't have Discovery Channel for a long time growing up, but I'd always be watching the Discovery Channel. And one of the my earliest memories are these honeypot ants. And I don't know if you know much about these ants, but they're really, really cool where they have a special cast. That's like a, a special group of ant uh, that only, you know, that uh, that is present uh, when, you know, resources are not super available or, yeah, they're, they're there. They're always there, but they really start to transform when resources are available, which you can see here on the top of this cavity right here are all these honeypot ants that are filled with honeydew, right? So when times are really good, all the other worker ants will go out there, collect all sorts of nectar, and they'll start spitting it into the mouth of these other ants so that they can you know, serve as this huge, huge receptacle of honeydew. And my, my dad's an artist and he trades a lot of art. He's uh, big into Australian art as well. And this is a piece that, you know, from our house that has always fascinated me uh, because even amongst the Aborigines of Australia, you know, honeypot ants are more than just species. They're more than just insects. They're more than just a type of animal on the ground, right? These insects themselves have a little bit of wisdom in them, right? They know when times are good. They know when they need to start storing up some food reserves. Uh, they know how to utilize uh, these food reserves. And the relationship amongst the people of Australia it goes back thousands and thousands of years. Uh, but my favorite thing about honeypot ants in particular is that um, you know, indigenous people always knew where to find them, knew where to locate them. They knew so much about the natural history of these ants. You know, even prior to David Attenborough and all his fancy cameras, Indigenous people can, they used to, they, they're still able to go around with sticks and look at that kind of desert landscape and excavate these ants and find these ants and utilize these ants. Um, and I do have a particular part of this video that I want to show. Here we go with the uh, one ant, you know, just cleaning that particular ant, making sure that this, all these resources are, are really nice. And sometimes, you know, the, the nests are super visible like this. Uh, oftentimes they're not. And basically all I wanted to show you is David Attenborough eating this, but I think I clipped it at the wrong spot. And then in times of need, right? When there is not a lot of other resources 
in the you know in the environment, Aborigine people would utilize these as a an emergency food source. Rip band, you're getting one big shot of honey. So, so growing up, not only did I have all sorts of really cool Discovery Channel, you know, uh, information, uh, but I grew up, you know, somewhere very much like Fond du Lac, you know, on the lake. I'm over on Lake Huron, so I'm a whole lake over from you guys. Um, but where I grew up again, oh my God, we're, you know, we're kind of in this delta of Lake Huron too. So we're near Manitoulin Island, that's kind of blocking a lot of the wind. So there's this, there's all sorts of really cool ecology and environmental stuff. Here's my community right here, Mississauga First Nation. I grew up, uh, you know, five minutes off the official reserve, uh, just near the lake over here. Um, and, and, you know, you can drive, you know, if you're going to Sault Ste. Marie, if you're coming up from Detroit or something, you can drive along the Trans-Canada Highway, our big highway, and never ever see this particular area, this Mississauga Delta. And it's a super unique ecological system, right? It's a bird's foot delta. We don't get a lot of these bird's foot deltas anywhere in the world. Uh, there's one at the end of the Mississippi, we, we know that. Um, I think there might be one, there's one or two in South America. There are these super road deltas that have all sorts of really cool bird species, salamander species, fish species. You can already see just the diversity of habitat here. And this is in Northern Ontario, somewhere you kind of think is, eh, it's pretty boring. There's just a lot of things, but it's a really special place, not only ecologically, but also spiritually. And then unfortunately, like, you know, anywhere in North America, uh, when we have very special places, of course, people decide to put uh, golf courses nearby or a uranium upgrading facility nearby. And this is what we're facing globally, right? It's not just indigenous communities, animals, other countries, other ethnic groups and cultures, they're facing that encroachment of society. And I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to talk a little bit about and how do we understand animals in these types of environments. But again, just where I'm from, again, big pine mill, we have a, a billion lumberjack statues where I'm from. Everybody thinks lumberjacking is cool. Um, we also have Putin, that's a, a, a big thing for us. Um, but I was lucky. Um, this is the opportunity that I like to, I take a minute just to say, I, I'm super privileged, you know, I'm not from a remote reserve. We have a lot of reserves that are uh, in a lot more dire streets. Um, you know, I had access to land-based teachings, right? My, my grandparents, my father, and you know, all my extended family uh, were able to teach me about hunting, trapping, uh, my grandparents were medicine people. My other grandparents were lumberjacks, kind of just out in the bush all the time. So, so I was really lucky to uh, be closely connected to all, not only all these practices on the ground, but those, those environments as well. And of course, you know, my, my dad forced me to help him set net and go fishing and do all these things. So growing up, you always feel a little bit like a pack animal. You're always doing all the work while everybody gets to enjoy it. Um, but it's through those experiences that I said, okay, you know, the land is not just something to enjoy, right? The land is something you work at. The land is something where, you work, it's, it's where you go to learn. Um, and since I was young, I've been keeping exotic animals galore, right? I have all sorts of frogs. I have a bird that might fly into the picture here at some point, and I have all sorts of lizards. And this is what have, this is what always made me interested in school. It was kind of better understanding, better being able to see the environment, not only through my own eyes, but to try to see an environment through the eyes of a lizard, of a little frog, of, a, of some sort of fish. And, you know, and I struggled for a little bit in undergrad trying to think, oh, what the heck do I want to do, right? I did my undergrad in biomedical science and that was boring as heck. And, you know, humans are kind of annoying to deal with anyhow. Uh, so I'd rather just work with farm stuff and animals. And so, so eventually, you know, I, I took all that kind of gardening and, you know, that early farm experience and I started to, you know, transition and become some agricultural agroecologists uh, interested in insects. I grew a lot of different crops growing up, right? I'd look, I'd go out find, to try to find the rarest types of corn. Uh, this is my favorite type of corn right here, the Gaspé Flint corn. Super small, super cute. It's maybe a, a finger long. It only grows about you know, two feet high, so you can grow it on a porch or a patio. But what's really fascinating, not only does it have all these crop treats, it was also very important historically for a lot of the uh, settlers, a lot of the colonists on the East Coast when, you know, North America was first getting colonized. This was the only corn variety that was able to mature 
in some of those seasons that we had in the early 15, 1600s, where, you know, times where agriculture was a lot tougher back then. And I spent a lot of time uh, growing up in New Mexico and Arizona. So I was always fascinated by desert crops, right? And here we can see uh, the conventional corn variety on the right and a Navajo corn variety on the left. And you can see the Navajo corn variety has a bit of a longer uh, taproot. And as we plant uh, the conventional corn variety and the Navajo corn variety deeper and deeper into the soil, we see at some point only one of the uh, seedlings can actually emerge. Right, so that tells us a little bit about, okay, so not only were these uh, crop varieties, you know, chosen and maintained, but they're actually chosen. There's this evolution behind them that melded people together with humans. And this is why I've been so fascinated by biodiversity, right? That variety of life, you know, to me, I'm, th I'm always thinking of, you know, the, even I, I live in the ghetto in Winnipeg, but I'm always fascinated just by the diversity of squirrels. I can see multiple family lines of squirrels just based on their little pelt. Uh, you can see also, we have a lot of <laughs> wild cats, right? I say, oh, I know whose son you are to this little grumpy cat. Like I'm, you know, I'm able, I'm always interested in creating these big uh, life histories for all that biodiversity around uh, us. So, you know, something that I'm interested in on the scientific side is like types of biodiversity. Of course, ecosystem bi biodiversity. What type of habitats do we have in an area? We can have plains, we can have forests, we can have scrubland, shrubs, we can have all sorts of things in a designated area. Okay, th that makes sense. Species diversity is something we think about more, right? The different number of things, the different number of cows, the different number of caterpillars or chickens, the different numbers of birds. That, that's an easy concept. But something we don't necessarily appreciate that much is genetic diversity. I'm the, actually the lightest person in my whole family it's not just the light here, I am really light versus my sister, right? Oh my God, uh, you don't wanna to travel to Mexico with my sister, Jen, right? They might not let her back into the US after that, she's so dark. Um, and we see this with animals as well, but you know, they're not always these topical uh, diversities, right? You can have the very similar genetic diversity or very similar looks, but very different genetic diversity. Um, so something like these two corn varieties, they might look super similar, Right, but you know, there's probably some genes that are, you know, that are a little bit different. And you know, I talked about species diversity, but we can also think about genetic diversity and how different the genes of a Holstein cow is relative to the Jersey cow. You know, they all max out at about what 1,200 pounds or so. Uh, they're all decent milk producers, but now there's one or two genes that change that you know exterior appearance appearance of them. Right, they're they're not that different relative to uh, say a cow and a moose or a cow and a deer. So, so this genetic diversity might not always be visible and it's sort of fascinating. Species diversity, easy. Different types of flowers, different types of bugs. The sum of all different species gives you that species diversity. And where I am right now at the university, I'm looking at how we can start thinking about diversity uh, and biodiversity in agriculture. Of course, I work on bees and I'm always trying to bring in bees, but if we need, if we want more diversity with our bees, we have to think about that ecosystem diversity and the genetic diversity at the foundation of the land, right? What are those species present in these ecosystems if we want that greater biodiversity on top of it at other trophic levels, right? The animals eating the plants, the animals using the plants and things like that. And a lot of the work that happens in uh, our department focuses on all sorts of cool beneficial insects, right? So we have insects that eat other insects like uh, the lady beetles here on the right, insects that will lay their eggs in other insects and pop out uh, like we have here in the middle. Uh, and then of course, insects that visit flowers and utilize either nectar or pollen, or they might steal nectar or pollen from other bees and things like that. So, so this is what we do in our lab. But again, we, we try to make sure that we are not forgetting that rest of that biodiversity that we might not necessarily see. You no know, pest biodiversity is really cool or a pathogen uh, biodiversity is really cool. Here's some downy mildew. No farmer wants to see that, uh, but you do want to see this cool fungal species, right? You want to see uh, all these great uh, rhizospheric uh, fungal species here that add to the uh, you know sequestration of carbon, the fixation of nitrogen. All they really build up the soil nutrient capacity. <clears throat> and you know, 
being interested in bees means I'm very interested in taking our conventional farm systems and thinking about how we can make it look more like a conventional uh, ecosystem or what did it, or making it closer to that ecosystem that the farm system replaced. Again, it's never going to be perfect again, but we have to think of our farm systems in a way to think about diversity and how we can incorporate greater diversity. Because, you know, why do we need to care about diversity? I'm telling you, okay, I love all these different weird things. That, that's fantastic. But it's the interactions and the number and the diversity, the different types of interactions that we have between all our species. That's what matters, right? It's the number of uh, organisms that are primary producers. What are those, how many things do we have that is capturing energy from the sun and creating all sorts of cool resources for things to either eat, to live under, or to utilize for nesting? Um, you can see all sorts of areas where biodiversity can actually benefit uh, something like a farm system, right? You can have uh, all sorts of fantastic interactions uh, that create nutrients in the soil, we could have uh, interactions in the ground that actually, you know, might kill your favorite thing. But that interaction, just because it's not good for you, doesn't mean it's not good for the system, right? All these things have their own little food webs and all their own little cool networks that need to be there. So when we think of these ecosystem functions, uh, we think of ecosystem functions in terms of what do they do for humans, right? We kind of neglect thinking about what they do for insects. Um, but, you know, broadly speaking, you think of them as the bio, biological, geochemical, and physical processes that take place in an ecosystem, right? So provisioning function, provisioning something, creating something, food production, supporting functions, that's going to support the long-term sustainability of something, like soil formation, uh, nutrient regulation, right? Those are regulatory functions, something we don't necessarily think about, but it's uh, equally important ecosystem function, are these cultural functions. And, and we see this, right? We, we don't tend to appreciate what a forest can tell you about that history of the people that lived there or what a corn variety can tell you about the people who harvested it or what this one weird looking goat species might tell you about the people who came here and this goat was so important to them that 400 years we still have this weird goat with like six horns, right? Those things tell us so, so much. And of course, the examples I like to talk about in a lot of my classes are things like, you know, Trail of Tears being, right? The, the big mass forced marching by the United States government of Southeastern Indigenous peoples to Oklahoma Territory. You know, the Trail of Tears being, you know, people uh, posit that, you know, people died, people forgot, people dropped these, uh, uh, this, sorry, this bean variety along the trail. And for a few years after the Trail of Tears march, you're able to see these beans um, across the landscape tracking the progress of the people. Um, but beyond that, right, we have you know, a lot more positive stories about all sorts of different crop cultivars that we still have to this day. And again, you know, that more, it's, it's really good that we have this because more biodiversity means more ecosystem function. Uh, I don't know if anybody's been to uh, David Tillman's plots over at the University of Man Minnesota, but again, David Tillman's this, you know, very godlike scientific figure that really started the conversation of diversity equals more ecosystem productivity, right? So he'd plant one species in one square, four species in a different square, 10 species in a different square, and just to see how productive it is, right? You can see some of these are, are really green while, while some of them are kind of boring. Um, so so that, that, that's what we know, and this is really important, especially when we're thinking of food production. You know, this is just a, a small example graph where we see as we go up with the number of species, we're going to get more creation of biomass, which is really important. But you know, again, this is what indigenous people themselves have been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years. You go to the Three Sisters Garden, which, you know, of course, everybody wants to talk about. It's the most basic example of these things. And almost every uh, nation has their own example of Three Sisters, Four Sisters. Uh, but again, that's that principle of increasing biodiversity in a small area by, um, or increasing function by increasing the biodiversity, right? You even, we even put it on our coins. And anyway, oftentimes we think above ground, but we don't think of that diversity below ground. Right? So, oh my God, if I was a little uh, bacterial species, I would love to have all sorts of these cool little ladders to move around up and down the plant on right here. Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip a lot of this, but you know where I'm from, 
uh, we do a lot of fire management or we historically have done a lot of fire management and that process in itself creates that diversity, right? When you get to these old, these kind of boring old forests, you have a bunch of boring old trees, big woof, uh, but you throw a little bit of fire in there, then you open up that canopy that, oh my God, you're getting medicinal plants, you're getting more grasses, you're getting herbs, you're getting shrubs, uh, you're getting seedlings, you're getting, you know, you're creating that bedding ground for deer, uh, you're getting blueberries, you're getting animals that can come in and eat that deer, you're increasing that biodiversity. So Indigenous peoples, like again, across all the Americas, had their own ways to manage biodiversity and enhance biodiversity to get us to this new place. And, you know, maybe some of those, uh, and people still use it today, if we go down to uh, cacao fields in Mexico, oh, you know, people are growing bananas and cacao together, right? They're putting fire in there, recreating this kind of ecosystem, um, and planting multiple crops together to give us our beautiful cacao for all our chocolate. So something I like to do and something that I think is, you know, just awesome is pollination. And yes, I could tell you about all the hundreds of bee species we have in uh, Manitoba, all the hundreds of bee species you have in Minnesota. But to me, what's really important is that degree, the extent of the value of that service that they provide. Um, so, so this is a lot of the times that the type of experiment I'll do in the field is comparing how good a pollinator is by allowing it to pollinate flowers, but then you know, me or one of my students becoming the pollinator and loading up these flowers with a bunch of pollen and then comparing who's better, right? So if a, a pollinator can do as good as a human putting as much pollen as possible, that's one darn good pollinator. And, and from that, you can start to kind of identify when you're missing pollinators, right? So if the pollinator community, if all that number of species of pollinators in that environment are not getting that same blueberry yield at the end of the season like I am with my hand pollinated flowers, that means we're missing a few bees, right? This plant is adapted to produce this much. There's just not enough bees to actually get us there. So, so that's the basis, that's the fundamentals of a lot of my work. And what I'm looking at right now is looking at how we can start measuring uh, uh, ecosystem function based on maybe some functional traits or some characteristics of bees. Here we have a bumblebee on the left, a leafcutter bee in the middle, and a honeybee on the right. We can already see that they're utilizing the flower super differently. A honeybee can just barely stick its eyeballs in there, get its tongue, access some of that. Okay. <laughs> These leafcutters, which I, I think they're, they're kind of dumb uh, as bees go, um, you know, they just crawl in there. They just kind of get themselves covered in pollen. They'll chew away at stuff and, and they'll find the nectar. Uh, with bumblebees, we see they have even more challenges, right? They're monstrous. They can just barely hang on to these flowers. But we know bumblebees often also have a really cool characteristic that I'll show you a little bit later on cause, uh, called buzz pollination, which makes them better than all of these other bees combined. But just to maybe go back in the story a little bit, what is pollination? Reproduction, right? Pollination is the simple act of reproduction of a plant, right? So we'll have the, the stamen, right? The stamen right uh, here. These are the male parts of the flowers. We'll have the anthers on top of the stamen. That's, you know, they, they have the grainy pollen there. Uh, the pistil is on top. Uh, the pistil holds the stigma right here in the middle. Uh, again, that's where you deposit the pollen. Um, bam, and that is, you know, then it creates that, uh, uh, sorry, it'll create that gametophyte, right? The, the pollen will be deposited onto this, uh, sorry, onto the stigma, and it'll go all the way down the pistil to, uh, uh, my God, the, to, and get to the ovary to fertilize it right here. But what's missing, right? It's, it's hard to get that, it's hard to move that pollen, right? So we need these bees. But do we necessarily always need bees for pollination? Well, well, for the most part, that's true. About almost 90% of species, a flower or a plant species we know actually need an animal pollinator. So 90%, 87.5% of species need some sort of insect pollinator They need, or animal pollinator. They need somebody to help them move that pollen around. Um, but what happens with, with species that don't need animal pollination? you know, they, they do just as good, right? So if we look at all of our conifer species, 
All these species are pollinated by wind. Most grass species, again, are also pollinated by wind. Right, and I don't know if anybody this is have this is happening. have to bump this tree when all those uh, male flowers are full of pollen will create this huge, huge, huge cloud of pollen. Even this video says, oh my God, right? it's, a, it's just so, so crazy. So, so species adapt, um, or species don't necessarily need to adapt. Um, we know conifers are a little bit older than our, fl uh, our flower species, our flowering plant species. But for the most part, you know, Pine trees are not that valuable. I mean, oh, sure, they're they're good for all sorts of uh, wood products, medicines, um, lumber, and things like that. But you know, the vast majority of food that's interesting, that's exciting, uh, benefits from insect pollination. Something like wheat, which again, we eat a lot of darn wheat, probably more wheat than we should. That doesn't need animal pollination. But wheat, wheat is so boring. I, I like to make bread myself, but you know, wheat is kind of boring. And if we look globally at just different cropping systems, right? So all these little circles represent a different type of uh, crop. So in Brazil, it's a lot of fruit crops. In India down here, it's a lot of vegetable crops. Uh, same with China. These two circles uh, or the two colors within the circles represent um, crops that are either dependent on honeybees or on wild, uh, other wild pollinator species. So you can see only in very few of these examples do we see a lot of yellow. Right over here in California with some almond, uh, over here in Japan with um, plums, plums and cherries. Uh, you know, some other crops have some honeybees, but for the most part, we see a lot of circles where, you know, honeybees are not as important as wild bees. And we know increasingly crop pollination is going to be in demand going forward. So these two graphs show us the growth of honeybee colonies on the left. As you see, oh, you know, they're not quite, it's not quite growing at the one-to-one -one rate. Uh, but then on the right, if we look at the uh, growth in area of crops dependent on pollination, we've seen a huge increase since the 1990s of farmers planting things that need pollination. So already we can start to see a disconnect. So oh, we can't think about relying on honeybees for the rest of our pollination. We really need to start thinking of different options. Um, but you know, and, and honeybees, if, if you're a farmer, if you're, if you're somebody who, uh, farmer, if you're somebody who keeps honeybees, you know how uh, valuable honeybees are. Globally, we think that pollination is at least worth about you know, 70, $80 billion. Uh, in Canada, just by itself, just honeybees themselves are worth about $2 billion, right? That's huge. That's just honeybees. That's not all the wild pollinators. And we know when we don't have honeybee or when we don't have poll good pollination, we have really messed up fruits, right? We have really small uh, blueberries, deformed cucumbers, deformed raspberries, really poor canola and other crop yield. And we know increasingly beekeepers don't necessarily want to bring their honeybees into farms, right? All the issues associated with fungicides, with uh, insecticides, with the value of the crop, uh, you know, it, a lot of beekeepers are just worried about the crop being nutritious, uh, nutritious to their honeybees. So they say, oh, I'd rather go to a more uh, nutritious crop for my honeybees. So I don't want to go to your blueberry fields, for example. So this actually happened to me in uh, British Columbia when I was doing my PhD. We were seeing a lot of beekeepers uh, not wanting to bring their bees into blueberry farms. And generally, when we see those poor crop yields, okay, we can look at the yeah, you know the easy agronomic nutrients, um, watering, irrigation type stuff. But oftentimes, if it's a pollinator dependent crop, we neglect the role that pollinators play in giving us that good crop. So again, this is my interest is really trying to figure out how to make farms a little bit more friendly for bees. Uh, here we have. I have two brave students and two not so brave students here in the in bee suits that are just again looking at bees and you know trying to understand their behavior. Here we are in New Brunswick um, again, just pollinating. You can see me with a toothbrush in hand, pollinating blueberries to try to understand how blueberry uh, and bees in New Brunswick are interacting and working together. And in a lot of the work that we saw, 
in uh, British Columbia and a little bit in Michigan, um, but more so in British Columbia, was that for the most part, if farms had more bees per acre, no, this is per hectare, they would be getting about uh, $15,000 more of blueberries, just if they had more bees. That's huge, right? Uh, that's a huge amount over hundreds and hundreds of hectares just because they didn't have enough pollinators. And you know, one of the things that's the most frustrating for farmers has always been this variability. They're not able to predict how many, how much blueberry they're going to get per plant. Um, and we've seen this consistently that you know, nobody really knows how to predict or how to maintain uh, some of these yields. So oftentimes, right, we can get farmers all over the map. Some farmers will have, you know, you want to have zero yield deficit. You want your um, blueberry to be as big as possible. A yield deficit is when uh, we get a lot more yield with hand pollination relative to wild pollination. So you want to be on the right side of the graph. So you can see only a few farmers, all these points represent different farmers in different years. Only very few farmers have low yield deficit, but those farmers tended to always have more wild bees in their farms. So, you know, of, of course, one of the things that's interesting, we can look at bees and their behavior. Do they spend more time on the flower? Are they depositing more pollen? That's exactly what they're doing, right? If we take my three favorite bee subjects here, uh, we'll see the bumblebee worker deposits about, um, or, or visits about, you know, three more flowers per minute relative to a honeybee or a leafcutter bee. When we look at something like pollen grains, right? How many pollen grains are they actually able to deposit on that stigma? Again, we see bumblebee workers and they cut our bees depositing double the amount of honeybees, uh, double the amount of pollen relative to honeybees. So honeybees are really bad pollinators in a lot of crops, right? So, so, so we utilize them as the default, but a lot of times they're just not good. Um, and, and we can look at the type of pollen that bees are using by putting them under the microscope uh, again, this is one of my favorite kind of nerdy things. Uh, you can see the uh, blueberry pollen on the left and then a typical rosaceae pollen. So this could be an apple species. It could be a wild rose species. It could be a plum species. Um, but, but we can detect these differences and we can steal the pollen off of bees to better understand what they're utilizing in the environment. So again, even with two you know, different bumblebee species, right? On the left, we have uh, Bombus huntii. And on the right, we have Bombus bosnicensii, two completely different bumblebee species, but visiting, living in the same environment, they might actually choose to forage or to use flowers in very different ways, right? I'm gonna choose this dandelion while I only prefer clover, right? So even bee species themselves have these really interesting relationships, but again, we still don't understand. Uh, so they'll be choosing to use resources differently in the environment. Going back to, again, uh, some of my favorite bee species, here we have uh, two bumblebee species, one on the left, one on the far right, and then a honeybee right in the middle. And all these uh, names on the bottom represent different types of flowers. So our, uh, our um, yellow-faced bumblebee here, Bosnicenskii, really loved wild rose pollen, right? So that was their preferred pollen. On the far right, this bumblebee is actually useful for blueberry farmers. You know, more than 50% of the pollen that it was bringing back was actually blueberry. Uh, but then when we look at honeybees and all the pollen we stole from honeybees coming back to their colony, well, we see about 10% of their pollen was blueberry. But then for some reason, 20% of their pollen was um, buttercups, right? They had to go for a buttercup flower, like the most rare flower in the environment. That's what they really wanted to bring back to their colony for some reason. Despite the millions and millions of blueberry flowers all over this farm site, they still chose buttercup pollen for some reason. So, you know, knowing that we decided, okay, you know what we're gonna do? We're going to create an ecosystem by bringing in a bunch of these pollinators. So we brought bumblebees in bumblebee boxes. We brought leaf cutters in their little domes, right? You can buy leaf cutters by the pound. We brought in a whole bunch of honeybee colonies. But even when we created this super diverse ecosystem with all three species, and then we look at pollen deposition, 
look, our pollen deposition wasn't actually that good. It was maybe better with just pure honeybees. You know, despite honeybees not depositing a lot of pollen per bee, just the number of honeybees sometimes was good enough. In our, you know, in our system with only bumblebees, right, sometimes just bumblebees were depositing as much pollen as all three species of bees in the environment. Right, so we get these really nonsensical things in science that you know, just don't, you know, don't make sense. And, you know, and it gets us thinking about why don't all bees act the same? Well, of course, we know that some bees require special behavior right, or a large body size. If you're not a big bee, maybe you can't depress a certain part of the flower to access those rewards. If, you're, um, if you have a really short tongue, maybe you can't get into those deep flowers, so you need to find these open, easy access flowers. Generally, when you have these uh, flowers with these long floral tubes, you're going to need a bee with a long, sorry, with a very long tongue. And even in a bumblebee, you have bumblebees that have short tongues, bumblebees that have long tongues. So you'll see different bumblebee species on each of these flowers. And then sometimes you'll just have a bee that can sneak in the flower like we have here on the left. Um, it, it just jumps in there, it has no problem. And, and then I talked a little bit about ecosystem diversity and why it's important. <clears throat> but again, landscape adds complexity, right? So we can see two different farm sites here, but depending on what type of bee you are, you might not actually see more than you know, this area of the farm here, maybe this corner of the farm here, because we have something uh, we know for a fact that the size of a bee is a very good predictor for their foraging range. So a bumblebee might be able to see two, three kilometers of their environment, while a leafcutter bee will see you know, maybe 200 to 300 meters of its habitat for its lifespan. Right, so when we think, oh, this farm is super diverse, well, not if you're stuck right in the middle of this farm, right? That bee will never see these forests, while a bumblebee might be able to see all those treed areas. And I told you something else unique. The awesome thing about a lot of different wild pollinators is that they have buzz pollination, right? So we know flowers like blueberries, uh, rhododendrons, there's a whole group of flowers that have these porocidal anthers that will only release their pollen when a an organism or when something vibrates at the right frequency, right? So a bee will vibrate at right frequency, bam, that, that flower will expel all its pollen. You can also do this with a toothbrush. Uh, so we developed a method where you just use a toothbrush to get all that pollen. Um, and here you can see just a quick little video of this is fascinating and how easy it is for this large, super monstrous bee to get all this pollen. So usually they'll, they'll find a nice piece of the flower, bite into it so they don't fall off a bit, and then start to vibrate, right? So they disconnect their wing muscles, vibrate on the flower, and then it, you know that pollen falls all over their body, which then they then clean up and kind of store up particular areas. You can also do it with these uh, tuning keys and things like that to get that right uh, frequency. So just, just cool, uh, you know, evolution, evolutionary relationship between plants and uh, bees. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these slides. Some of them are kind of boring. Um, but what we're doing right now is we're trying to better understand how different bee species are utilizing different floral resources. Here in Manitoba, you know, we have actually multiple bee scientists in my, well, there's even a better bee scientist right next door to my lab. Um, and you know we have a lot of bee records. Our students are gathering a lot of bee records. But then as soon as we go off, maybe off the beaten path a little bit, we see that we have no darn clue about bees. Right? And if you look, what I have, what I highlighted in the red here are all the First Nations in Manitoba. Right, so what I'm, what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to build in some sort of uh, bee identification project for schools, high school modules, uh, you know, where you know schools or, or people that are interested can catch a bunch of bees, uh, put them in the freezer, then ship them to the university. We can identify them. Uh, we can start filling up some of these uh, scientific databases to be able um, to to be able to start to describe. Uh, some of these areas in terms of their bee diversity, but also allow communities to start creating their own entomological library. Right? We know a lot about 
fish. We know a lot about different birds. We know where to hunt. Um, but you know, but as time goes on, we're going to need to increase and continue to ve develop indigenous knowledge, that local knowledge system that we have to better understand these things. Because bees are more than just honeybees. Right here we have just a, a normal honeybee versus, again, one of my uh, favorite bees, Wallace's giant bee. This bee's from Indonesia. Uh, but you can fit a honeybee basically just in these, just in its chelicera, or you can fit it right in its mouth parts. It's so massive and mean looking. So globally, we have more than 20,000 species of bees. In, Minnesota, uh, in uh, Manitoba, at least, we have, uh, you know, before my colleague Jason started, they thought, oh, about 200 species. Jason's only been here for three or five years now, three years longer than I have. And he's already added 200 more bee species, right? Maybe not 200, but we, we now know that there's probably 400-ish bee species here in uh, Manitoba. And even, you know, even my student this summer, uh, he found the first, uh, first, another new record for Manitoba of this bee species that was never documented here before. Um, the vast majority of bees are not eusocial, right? They don't live in colonies. They're solitary bees where that, uh, you know, that female will take that task and create all sorts of little capsules where she'll gather a pollen, lay an egg, seal off that cavity and create another one. Right, so you can have them nesting in stems. You can have them nesting in cavities in wood. You can have them uh, creating cavities in soil. Um, so we don't have, you know, there's, yes, I think a lot of social bees are really cool, but solitary bees, you know, they, they have it even tougher, right? It's just one female doing all the work for that next generation, which I think is always really cool. And of course, you know, bees are beautiful. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip over this and kind of just go through some of the, the species here to kind of finish this off. So when you're looking at bees, you really have to keep an open mind, right? We think of bees as being yellowish and blackish, right? But we can, if we look at something like Andrenids, oftentimes, especially if they're small, you know, they kind of just look black with a little bit of yellow. Sometimes they don't even have a lot of yellow, it might be brownish. So we might mistake them for a fly or a wasp because they don't have a lot of banding. Uh, we might have plaster or, or cellophane bees, right? Calididae's. Um, again, they can have all sorts of diverse patterns. Again, something like a halaeus might look more waspy uh, compared to calides, which again has that banding that we're um, more more typical, uh, we're more easily able to describe as a bee. And then in terms of sweat bees, right? Oh my God, we can have such diversity of sweat bees, right? We can have agapostomons, which are you know, super cool metallic. Uh, we could have sphacoides again, which you know have this really nice red abdomen, which is super diagnostic. But again, it kind of has that um, you know waspy look. And we could have all sorts of different dialectus and lesioglossum species that are super tiny, really hard to describe. And then they, you might mistake for a fly or for a wasp if you didn't look close enough. And of course, we have some of my favorites: the, the bumblebees and the family Apidae. Honeybees also belong to the family Apidae, but we know honeybees are not native, right? They're all um, European species, at least the honeybees uh, that we have here in North America. Um, but again, bumblebee species occupy that uh, same family. And again, we have multiple species of bumblebees, uh, depending on the regions you're at, uh, th that you're in. Um, and we also have really cool Anthophoridae, right? Digger bees are long horned bees that are, um, they have specialized uh, appendages to, you know, dig in or uh, to, to create their nests sometimes. Um, yeah, and I think I'm gonna leave it there. I have a lot more slides, but uh, I'd be love to have some questions and for us to be able to talk about bees a, a little bit. Basically, I, one of the things that I, I kind of wanted to end on was that it's really important for us to start thinking about uh, creating environments for, oh my God, <laughs> uh, creating environments for bees. Um, you know, in Canada, we're thinking of this colonial hangover and lack of ability to manage our land. And we know the historic land uses by people created that diversity. So being able to have some say in something like a hydroelectric project that's you know clearing hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of land, that will give us an idea, that will allow us to really recapture some of this diversity. Uh, this is some of the work that my uh, master's student who just finished did. On the right, we have all the different plant species from one site. And on the left, we have all, or no, on the right is the honeybee species. On the left is the plant species. But you can see how complicated these networks are. 
And it's really important for us to start understanding that and creating that local knowledge because it's that local knowledge that ends up going into our land management decisions that eventually changes a lot of our institutions and how we do science and how we educate people about bees at the university level. And when we start to bring these things together, people, you know, the worldview of something like maintenance of diversity for conservation will actually change. Um, so sorry for the, I don't know if I went over time, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Here's my, uh, a little doggy in the, in the lab. <laughs> oh, this is perfect timing, miigwech for this. Um, you said so many things, but I found really, I love that you started talking about what the land is where you go to learn and agriculture is more than just a way to produce a commodity and um, just how it increased biodiversity, um, increases the ecosystem. So I know one question I had was just, you know, a lot of these folks are, you know, at home growing in raised beds, some have their own farms, um, we have farm out at Gitaganing. Um, what are some things that we can do as growers and gatherers to um, support our pollinators and to support some of the work that you're doing? You're muted. <laughs> Uh, sir, I think that, that's a great question. And, you know, this is one of the things that I think um, every individual person can actually contribute to, because um, there's a lot of research uh, that, that other fellow colleagues and uh, other students that I went to school with found areas like Victoria, right? So it's a fancy area in British Columbia, a lot of old, uh, old older people with really established gardens, beautiful gardens. A lot of those gardens, that's where we we're seeing more diversity rather than in the oak savannah ecosystems, the remnants of those ecosystems, they're, they're really species poor. It was in these really cool, complex gardens. And the way to make a really complex, cool garden is to make sure that you're planting, you, you have a planting strategy, but that you have a floral resource on the ground year round, right? Because some of these bees might only emerge for a second or two here and there, right? So they're not going to always be, um, be present when say your, your raspberries are blooming. So making sure that they have something to forage on from that early season all the way to the fall will really allow you to get that diversity or to at least support that diversity. Thank you so much. We have another question from the chat. Um, Emily says, this was just a small thing you said in the context of using fire to manage biodiversity, but I'm really curious to know more about management practices and medicinal plants. Do you have any resources you could share? You know what, I, I really don't, and that's a fantastic, fantastic question. I don't know why, I haven't thought about that or, um, that's a really awesome question. Um, so yeah, I don't have a resource, but you know, one of the things that I think is really important when it comes to a lot of this fire management, historically, it was very locally based, right? So my fire practices in Northern Ontario were, are very different than those fire practices in uh, Western British Columbia. And those were very different than those in New, uh, Eastern New Brunswick. Um, so you really, and maybe this is one of the things that I think is important for people to I don't know how you get funding for anything. I struggle at getting funding for all my research, uh, but it's really to start identifying what type of habitats those target species are and understanding the natural history of those target species and then trying to recreate that through your own custom fire regime. Um, yes, yeah, most of my resources are just through the uh, traditional knowledge holders that I try to glean some information and trends from. So yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have anything more specific. Uh, I, I will look into my stuff and I do have something. Thank you so much. Caitlin, did you have another question? I wasn't sure if you did. Okay, awesome. Um, I had a question. Um, you mentioned that pollination can affect fruit size and shape. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how that works? Yeah, so something that we don't often think about is, okay, the size of our fruit is dependent on all sorts of really funky, cool plant hormones. And the initiator or one of the control mechanisms for creating plant hormones are the seeds, right? So those ovaries need to be 
um, properly fertilized or maximally fertilized to enable the production of these plant hormones that result in not only the growth of the fruit, but the ripening of the fruit. So if we have less seeds or, you know, if we're not pollinated enough, so that mechanism to start those plant hormones might not actually ever um, be fulfilled, right? So you'll, you'll have weird fruit misshapen. Uh, you'll have all sorts of other problems with ripening. So better pollination results in better ripening, better fruit size, better fruit quality, because it's enabling all those uh, hormones to you know, take on more water, create more sugars, create more nutrients, uh, create all the other little biochemical um, molecules to help with, with the ripening process. So they need to be, it needs to be linked pretty well. Um, so that first step of pollination is just one step of that complicated biochemistry that takes place in a flower. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, Russ, ha Russ had a question. I think he might've hit, hit send before it was quite finished, but um, he says, where, where do you find most of the bees living maybe in their environments? Yeah, so, so, so it's, you know, it, it's really cool. Um, bees are so, sometimes so super specific. Um, one of my favorite places to, say if I had no idea about any of these places, I would go somewhere with you know, a lot of unmowed lawn, a lot of weedy junk, maybe a bunch of uh, logs or lumber that people didn't use, piles of sand, piles of logs, just with different nesting habitats and different floral resources. So I'm often looking for kind of that scrub land, right? So, so land that is just not being managed, not being mowed, but it has a lot of potential resources from floral resources to nesting resources. So things with hollow stems, uh, things with the, you know, kind of mounding type, you know, uh, grasses, um, things with uh, just cavities, right? Old wood piles and things like that. Looking for habitats that have all sorts of diversity within themselves is a really good place to start. Thank you. Am I missing any other questions in the chat? I'm not sure. If anyone would like to speak up, um, I know Caitlin in the past you've offered to stop the recording if anyone wanted to speak past the recording time. You can raise your hand or say something in the chat if that's how you feel comfortable. I do have a question. Um, is the very colorful photo, is that a bee from Manitoba? Um, and then also like the smallest bee that, that you have um, kind of find compared like like size compared with a honeybee, the smallest bee that you have seen. Eh. Yeah, so we can find some, I, I probably cheated and used a more colorful bee uh, for one of the photos, but you can find something like a agapostamon, kind of the, the green metallic uh, sweat bees and a lot of different habitats. So it can range from all the way from Canada to Argentina. Um, so I know for a fact there's uh, agapostamon in um, Minnesota for sure. So um, you should be able to find those. And again, um, I showed some extreme examples of, of colors, but you can find even kind of a boring black bee. When you look at it really closely, you start to see really interesting patterns and sheens on it. Um, and the smallest bees, uh, yeah, you can find bees about the, the size of the head of a honeybee or the abdomen of a honeybee. You can find super, super tiny bees that are, again, really annoying to identify. So I leave it up to most of my students or uh, my colleagues to do that type of work. Hey, wait. Steve, do you have a question? No, I don't. I have a comment and I'm kind of, Jamie had made a comment here, uh, Damon Panic, He's the fire operations person at, in Fond du Lac Forestry. And I just spent the morning going around with him on uh, uh, looking at some of his, his, his plans for uh, burning. And he, he's got some real ambitious plans to try and get fire back into the communities where it belongs. And uh, we, there's, it's hard to do prescribed burning because it there's so much work, work ahead of time. But he, he may be one that you want to get more about the fire management, to get him out, get him in, involved with the, uh, 
you know, speaking to this group if they're interested. And I, I, I don't know if the rest of the, you know, some of you know that I, I was the, the forest manager at Fond du Lac and started the prescribed burning program with, with Vern Northrup. And, and he's continuing on and is really enthusiastic about it. You know, thanks, Steve. And that's something that we neglect, right? We, we don't think about what was here prior to the agriculture, especially in the Midwest. But we know from basically southern Manitoba, uh, kind of northern North, North Dakota, northern Minnesota, all the way down to uh, almost the panhandle in Texas, we used to have one of the biggest oak savannas in all of North America. I, I think it was actually the biggest oak savanna, right? So there's this huge swath of this fire managed oak savanna that you know evolved relationships with bees, bee species, all sorts of cool funky birds and animals that just doesn't exist anymore. Right? And that entirety of that range from Texas all the way to Minnesota, again, was a super diverse system that was managed for those at early successional diversity that resulted in all sorts of cool relationships that we're probably missing right now. And, and it probably had more more biomass per acre than what <laughs> what's currently there <laughs> per hectare. Okay, and then is it Delina? Do I see your hand raised? Yeah, Delina. Um, I just have a question. I'm part of a community garden, and I was wondering if we have like the pollinator plant species bees around the outside is going to encourage bees to come in and pollinate like our cucumbers and stuff or should we focus on having more of those like floral food species on the inside of our garden yeah so so regardless of whether they're <laughs> outside or inside a bee might ignore your thing irregardless right <laughs> no matter how close or far away you put from it if a bee really likes something uh, more so, if, maybe it's just a picky bee, right? We know there's some species that are picky. Um, they're going to ignore it either way, right? They're going to identify that resource. You're not going to be able to fool a bee to get it in there. So when you're thinking of these things, it's like, okay, I, I want to attract the most possible. I want them to be able to think of this area as something super diverse and super florally rich for them. And then again, hope for that spillover effect that happens onto our uh, plant species of importance. Yeah, so I don't necessarily think the placement is, some farmers will um, mow all their weed species uh, because they think it's distracting bees. Uh, but what our research shows that if you do that, the bees are just going to fly out of your field and looking for those things anyhow, right? So you're, you're wasting the time of the bee even more by doing that sometimes. Um, yeah, so yeah, just try to load, load it up and get more bees. Um, Surely when there's a, too much competition on some of those really nice things like a clover, they might just jump over and look for something else. Okay, and I, it is past time. So I just wanted to um, stop the recording and give people permission to go eat dinner or do whatever they need to do. And I don't know if Dr. Bobby Wash wants to hang one more second. So it looks like Julie might have a question, but I just wanted to say miigwech to everyone for attending. Um, and we'll, we'll be back again at the same time next week. Uh, so miigwech and let me hit stop.